Jeffrey, in basket, when I was watching recently, you know, he's this young creative mind who's wrestling with the expect expectations of the outside world. And I couldn't, I, I kept thinking how you as a young artist embodying this, going through a similar situation? Well, I understood uh, spaces that he inhabited. I understood uh, what he aspired to do in some ways. I felt a close kinship to him. I also think that there is a through line from his story to the story of Monk in American fiction. There's... Like bookends. Yes, yes, absolutely. When I, went to, when I came to New York, I lived in the Lower East Side, you know, traveling in similar spaces as he and... I also, I think, draw from similar um, creative sources or pools. His work speaks so deeply to me uh, when he refers to the undiscovered genius of the Mississippi Delta, or when he references Ali or Miles Davis, all of these things, his poetry. I, 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 I draw inspiration from those same sources I speak his language, so um, there, was, there was a lot of um, overlap. In fact, <clears throat> there was a lot of kind of interesting overlaps as well. A couple of years after the movie came out, I ran into my roommate. I lived on 10th and D deep alphabet city when I first moved to New York, waiting to go to NYU. Um, I was up on the fourth floor, had an apartment. She had a girlfriend who happened to use um, heroin. I'd never met her, but I knew this. I ran into my roommate, as I said, at a party sometime. She said, Jeffrey, I've been looking for you ever since I saw that movie. She said, you have no idea. When you were on the fourth floor of our apartment, Jean-Michel Basquiat was on the first floor all the time because there was a dealer there, apparently, according to her. According to her. And we just, we never met. We just overlapped. He passed away uh, later that summer. Um, the first summer in 1988 when I moved to New York. Um, it was when we were filming. We were filming one night uh, in, uh, on Bleecker Street. The previous night, I had, uh, uh, I'd had a dream. Back then, I had the freedom and the time to think about a character, particularly that for about you know, 24 hours a day, because I didn't have kids, you know? <laughs> and so I could really focus with everything. I had a dream this night that Fab Five Freddy came to talk to me. <laughs> Fab Five Freddy was a very good friend of, 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 of Basquiat's. And I was like, oh, well, that's interesting. I'd never met him. I'd seen him on the tube. So we're shooting the next night, and I'm sitting on Bleecker Street with my back up against the wall, just like waiting for the shot to be set up. And I look down the sidewalk and Fab Five Freddy is walking toward me. And I'm like, dude, what? I was like, I'm just dreaming about you last night. <laughs> and he's like, oh man, hey. <laughs> and it must've been weird for him. I'm sitting there dressed up as his, you know, one of his great friends. Um, but uh, there was a lot of like, uh, I don't know. There was just something in the air. In fact, when I was doing Angels in America, uh, I put in, after a year and a half, along with two of the other actors in the play, my notice to say that I was going to go off and, you know, do whatever was next. We'd done it for long enough. We put in our, you know, our letters of resignation. And, you know, and that was a matinee. Gave that letter in. After the show, I went back to my apartment, on, which wasn't far from the theater on the Upper West Side, and I hit my steam-powered answering machine. And, and there was a message from a friend of mine, a guy named Randy Sabusawa. He had done producing for Abel Farrar and, uh, and other folks. And 
I knew him from the neighborhood, and he said, hey, Jeffrey, uh, I'm helping this casting director find someone to play Jean-Michel Basquiat, and I thought of you. And I said to myself, this is the day that I left, decided to leave Angels. I said, that's the next thing that I'm gonna do. But correct me if I'm wrong, you came in to audition for Benny. I did, yeah. But then you play the part? Yeah, so Julie- It's the tell -us story, amazing. So, so actually, Chris Walken's wife, George Ann, and a woman named Sheila Jaffe were the casting directors. And, and uh, I had done a play with Chris. He played a Iago to the late Raul Julia's Othello in Central Park. And I was like, again, like the third Cypriot stone from the right. But man, mesmerizing. Oh my God. That was like a, a full year's worth of study at any acting school, watching them and watching Chris. Super smart, super smart. You know, people talk about actors, the best actors. Oh man, that guy, he took Shakespeare and it was as though he was recreating it out of his mouth with every breath. It was alive and he didn't care. There was no reverence for it. He just, ah, I was blind, but you'll not hear me. I mean, it was, <laughs> and we're, at one point, we're all, you know, young actors, we're sitting in the Delacorte, and you, you know, you can stand in the, these two voms at the end of the, you can stand and you can watch the stage, you know, from backstage. And we're standing there, we're, you know, we're just like, oh my God. He comes backstage at one point, he says to the uh, stage man, get these idiots out of there, what the fuck are they doing standing? <laughs> we were distracting him, and so we, you know, we. We, we, we couldn't do that anymore. Um, but, but so anyway, uh, his wife was casting. She, she called me and said, Julian wants you to come down and do a read through of the, of the play. And I, and I said, is Chris gonna be, of the, of the script? I said, is Chris gonna be there? Don't call my husband Chris. I said, well, I was in a play with him, I know him. Um, but anyway, went down and the read through happened. There was another guy playing Jean-Michel. They wanted me to play Benny, the role that Benicio Del Toro was going to do. He was already, you know, Julian and knew he wanted him to do that. So I decided to read that role, to read Benny, as I would read Jean-Michel Basquiat. And so the read-through ended, and uh, a couple of hours after I got back home, Julian called me and said he wanted to talk to me about playing that role. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah. I told you, I've seen it many times, and I just saw it recently, and again, and the physicality is mind-boggling. You know, you know, tell us about how did you embody all the, I mean, there's ticks and, and the way he walks. Well, he was a very particular character. He was an eccentric character, a brilliant guy, and he moved in his own way to his own drummer. And I studied everything that I could find about him. And there were some interviews. There's a, a documentary about him called The Radiant Child. But I had all of the stuff that's in The Radiant Child before it came out. I'd seen all of those interviews, everything, everything that I could find. I talked to a few friends, but he's a peculiar guy. There is, I, you meet some people who, when they pass early, they leave an enormous space in the lives of those who uh, were close to them. And he's that way. And people have this deep, deep sense of loss um, uh, regarding him. So talking to people, you get, you get a lot of emotion bl blended in, maybe not a lot of objectivity necessarily. I talked to some people, but I really studied him, his interviews, those things. Uh, I, and particularly, I studied his work because he was such, I think, a comprehensive artist that he's there inside the work. And I was, eh, I just combed through everything that I could, everything, just finding his voice, finding him. Uh, and then I would paint too. That helped, you know, understand the physicality and also uh, a facility with, with, with painting. Julian opened up his studio to me. I would go, every, you know, day and night and just paint, paint for six months. Some days I was there and there would be, oh, maybe a dozen and a half, couple dozen Basquiat's real pieces lined up around me. The, the, the producers were also collectors, so they were going about uh, collecting prior to the release of that film. 
Eh, not unwise. Anyway, the, so I would take uh, fragments of one uh, and fragments of another and put it on a canvas and try to recreate, you know, just to understand his language, his visual language, but also his poetry. And so I just, I mean, I just did everything I could to just consume as much information about him, including physicality, you know, but everything from inside out. I had, a, I had the luxury of time to be able to do that. And, uh, it's a brilliant performance. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. And in a couple of months, as you heard, Julian will release a Criterion Collection black and white version. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's yeah. pretty cool. The film, you know, the film has found uh, an audience, and I'm really pleased that we were caretakers to the introduction of part of his life to people who hadn't known him before. He's now among the most popular artists uh, in, on the planet right now. But at the time, he wasn't very well known, so I, I wanted to take good care of him and his memory in introducing um, him. But I'll tell you what, that film has found an audience, but it didn't really at the time, because it was pulled from the theaters. You know, people ask me about, you know, recognition and this and that, it's like, your work can't really be recognized if it's not supported. So the film was in the theaters and it was doing very well, you know, it was in, you know, the art house theaters and then suddenly it was gone. Yeah. So I'm glad that in spite of that, it has, you know, it's found, it's found an audience and it's done, um, you know, some hopefully not insignificant work in introducing this beautiful artist to people who might not have well, otherwise and introduce known him. you, introduce you and Julian Schnabel at the same time. Um, let's move on and take a look at Shaft and <laughs> Angels in America.